that it accounts for those received bits. So wherever there is a stuffed bit received, there should be a transition which is going on from state A to state B. Oh, I'm sorry, this should not have been B, this should have been A. So whenever you receive a stuffed bit, the CRC state remains the same, but then there is a transition going on in the trellis state which is from alpha to beta. So if you see the extended state, the, CRC, the transition corresponding to the CRC uh, transition is A to A and the transition which is corresponding to the trellis is alpha to beta. So basically whenever there is a stuffed bit received at the, at the receiver, what the two dimension trellis does is, whenever it's computing, whenever it's decoding the trellis diagram, it will stall the CRC cycle for one state which corresponds to one stuffed bit and then it keeps on moving the trellis state. So basically it will stop the CRC for one cycle and then it will move the trellis state for, uh, for that particular cycle where we have the stuffed bit. So this is how this uh, concept of extended trellis works. So we have designed this receiver in MATLAB um, and I think the receiver design of this was the most complicated part of this project. But then again it was the most interesting part as well because I could see some new things going on and you know, we generated a lot of data and we'll just take a look at how the data looks like. So here we have um, an extended trellis modulation with CRC16 and then here is the on the y-axis we have the percentage of successfully decoded packets, on the x-axis we have the bit error rate. And we did the simulations for uh, different size packets, uh, one is the 36-bit packet, 68-bit, 132-bit and 260-bit. And then all these simulations, for all these simulations we transmitted around 50 packets from the source to the destination and uh, we had these different bit error rates in the AWGN channel. So, we also compute the percentage of successfully decoded packets that uh, the receiver received successfully. So if you take a look at uh, the graph, we see that uh, the percentage of successfully decoded packets, it starts falling somewhere in this range, right, where the bit error rate is 0 0.1. So we can, you know, say that this technique looks good for bit error rates as small as 0 to 0 0.1, right. So um, again, if you compare for these different size of packets, we see that the 36-bit packet it fails a little bit later than these 260-bit packets, which intuitively also makes sense because the probability of having a bit error in the 36-bit packet is way, way, way lesser than what you have in 260-bit packet, right? But still, you see that uh, you know it fairly performs pretty well for even 260-bit packet sizes. So here is a diagram. Uh, here is a plot of the number of successfully received packets out of 100 versus the noise variance. So typically, what we are uh, doing here is we are changing the noise variance of the AWGN channel and then uh, we compare it for uh, all the different schemes that we had designed over BPSK modulation uh, where we are transmitting over the AWGN channel. So we have the turbo coding here. Um, if you see that for a noise variance of 4, the turbo coding has the maximum number of uh, successfully received packets out of 100. So turns out that turbo coding is still better than this modified beta by algorithm, but uh, it's the performance is quite quite close to that. And uh, this green line represents uh, the values for uncoded data, where we are not using channel coding at all altogether. So now this is another interesting plot that we plotted. Uh, this is uh, the packet error rate in uh, decibels versus the EB by N0. So this is not on the log scale. So this is not like the conventional plots that we plot. So uh, the reason why we did it on the linear scale is since we are sending packets, there were some uh, situations where we had absolutely no packets getting received properly at the receiver, which meant that the packet error rate was zero right here. So this is uh, this blue line right here is for turbo coding. The red line is for modified bit by, and this green line is for uncoded. So we see that for one particular value of EB by N0 ratio, right, for say EB by N0 ratio of 5, your turbo coding has a packet error rate of 0, right, which means that all the packets were received successfully. So again, this shows that turbo coding performs better than modified beta by, which in turn performs better than the uncoded, of course. Um, now, th this is the plot uh, which I was talking about previously, which says that uh, this technique does not really work well for the bursty channels. So, the modified Witter by algorithm and both the Witter by algorithm, they don't work for uh, bursty
university channels because this is one of the fundamentals of using metabyte decoding uh, is that we assume that all the bits which are in error are distributed randomly over the channel uh, or over the code word. So we tried to model a burst error channel in MATLAB and we saw that you know it, it fails for bit error rates as low as 0 0.02 or 0 0.04. So for the 260-bit packet, the percentage of successfully decoded packets is around about 15%. So every 100 packets that we transmitted, we saw that 85 packets were uh, not correct for even uh, small bit error rates in a bursty channel. So what do we do in such a situation? So we did a little bit of literature review and we found out that Reed Solomon codes, which are a class of the BCH codes, which are a part of, uh, which are kind of an extension of BCH codes, they actually um, are uh, good for the burst error channel. So we designed the Reed Solomon codes. Yeah, so this would fail. Um, so we designed the Reed Solomon code, codes, uh, which are again a set of linear block codes and a subset of BCH codes. Um, so the Reed Solomon code that we used for our design was 255, 235. So the error correction capability of this Reed Solomon code is n minus k on 2, uh, which means that to every 235 bits of data stream we have, we append 20 bits of redundancy, we make the entire uh, transmitted, uh, to be transmitted packet to be 255 bits long, and then the error correction capability of this scheme is 10 errors, which is uh, 255 minus 235 upon 2. So, Again, for, uh, for the implementation that we have here, we use an interleaver with the Reed Solomon code. So what an interleaver does is it, it essentially spreads the data. And so whenever you have a burst error coming in, whenever you have a burst each error and you expect a lot of bits to be corrupted at one particular location, what we essentially do is we try to spread the data so that the burst kind of spreads over, uh, over a, a, a smaller length of data. So for the simulations, we use 255,235 RS coding. We use uh, we have T as 10 here, and let's assume that the channel that we are uh, designing will give a burst of length 25, and then, which essentially means that uh, the required interleaver depth that we would want is 25 upon 10, which is the error correction capacity is equal to 2.5. So we'll have an interleaver which has a depth of 3. So basically in this design, the interleaver which has a depth of 3 would have 3 rows and uh, 255 columns in it. So this is the input data that I'm transmitting, this is the interleaved data and this is the received data. Uh, so now if you see that my input data is uh, of uh, length 255, these are just uh, simple ASCII codes. So this is uh, the input data that we are transmitting. So now we are interleaving the data, which means that we are res we are replicating each bit here. Now I'm just considering this as bit here in the simulations, just so that you know these alphabets make more sense. Because if I had included uh, ones and zeros, then it would have been really difficult for me to explain to the listener what's going on here. So I just used alphabets in place of bits. We'll still consider these alphabets as one bit. Um, so if you see that the interleaver is actually replicating each and every bit more than once, which is three. So you have three I's here, you have three spaces here, you have three A's. I am a student at the University of Florida. So now when you receive the code word, we have a, a length, the burst length here is 25, which means that you know, there are 25 bits which are getting corrupted. 25 subsequent bits which are getting corrupted and then we have a received data. So after interleaving, when we receive the data, we see that you know the length of the burst, burst is getting reduced. So this is what my receiver design does. It reduces the length of these 25 corrupted bits to just 7 corrupted bits. And now these 7 corrupted bits can obviously be corrected by using Reed Solomon code, uh, the 255 comma 235 reads sort of a code which has an error correcting capability of 10 which is obviously less than 7. Oh sorry, 7 is obviously less than 10 so this can actually correct these 10 errors.
so now we will discuss two of the most important class of codes called the Turbo codes and the LDPC codes. And these are also termed as modern class of codes. So these are the codes which are most widely used in the wireless communication systems today. So before jumping into the details, let me give you a brief background on how these Turbo codes came into existence. So uh, until early in the 90s, uh, people were uh, designing different kinds of codes like the convolutional code, the BCH code, the Reed Solomon code. And it turned out that the performance in terms of the control gain that was achieved with these uh, with those codes was, was not uh, really close to the Shannon limit. So they also came up with the idea of the computational cutoff rate, uh, which actually meant that you know there is a theoretical limit which is determined by the Shannon limit and then there is a practical limit which can be achieved and this practical limit which was termed as the code computational rate was actually less than what the theoretical limit was. So people used to target that code, computa code computational rate at that time uh, but then with the uh, uh, paper which was presented by a group of French people in 1991 or 1992 uh, they came up with this idea of turbo code. Uh, and then the results that they showed uh, shook the industry and then we got to see that the error gain that they are getting was really close to the limit. Uh, so what happens in this turbo code scenario is you have um, the encoder designed in such a way that you do a kind of a parallel uh, convolution with, 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 with interleaving in between and this convolution which is done in parallel is systematic in nature. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how these codes are different from other types of codes. So, basically in turbo code and LDPC code representation, we, pro we use more of a probabilistic mathematical approach um, as opposed to an algebraic mathematical approach which we used in convolutional coding, which we used in Reed Solomon coding. So, it's not that there is no algebraic um, mathematics in the design of turbo and LDPC codes, it's just that it's more of a probabilistic, uh, uh, probabilistic nature. So, why are these codes considered better codes? And um, so, these codes are considered better not because of their inherent structure. Rather, these codes are considered better because of their ability to get decoded in a faster way, in a better way. So, now there is a, a theory of generalized distributive law, uh, which tells that, uh, you know, there is a method of decoding which is possible in terms of iterations. Okay, and then you can use different terms for it. You can uh, use terms like uh, message passing, belief propagation, and things like that. But then, you know, the theoretical underpinnings in the paper, uh, which talks about the distributive law, the generalized distributive law, it gives a good description of how these uh, decoders can be implemented, which are faster than the other decoders. So this is why these codes are considered better because they give you a better performance, they give you a coding gain which is more than that, uh, which is really closer to that, that of the theoretical limits. So nowadays in systems which are designed today, it's, it's kind of uh, mandatory to have coding gains which are really close to the limit, about 1 dB away from the limit and things like that. So um, out of the turbo code and the LDPC code, um, my personal opinion is, is that this LDPC code are more widely used than turbo codes even today. So here is the simulation model which we designed in MATLAB. So we have the input coming in, we have the spreader, we have the uh, LDPC encoder, uh, we also designed the uh, encoder for the turbo code, we have the VPSK modulator over the AWG in channel, the demodulator, the decoder and the despreader. So this is the, the system that we designed for uh, carrying out the simulations. And here are some of the interesting results that we got. Um, again, before going into the results, I would like to mention that the data size here is 100 bits, which is kind of small when we are actually trying to simulate real world models. Um, but still for the purpose of uh, you know small simulation times and less computation, we used a data size of 100 bits. So if you see this blue line, the blue dotted line right here, it represents the LDPC coded data and then this red